James Brian Dean was a Hollywood legend. Despite being in just three films, he was already cemented as one of Hollywood's finest thanks to his iconic roles in Rebel Without a Cause, East of Eden, and Giant. Most of Dean's money from his acting roles went into buying high-end cars. Although acting was his bread and butter, he was truly passionate about motorsport. Eventually, Dean managed to get himself a beautiful Porsche 550 Spyder. When it came out in 1953, it was one of the fastest cars around. Despite the small engine, it was capable of outrunning much bigger cars thanks to weighing just 550 kilos. With a 1.5 litre four-cylinder, putting out 108 horsepower and 121 newton meters of torque, it had an astonishing 196 horsepower per tonne, putting it above even the 300 SL Gullwing, which came out the next year, and the legendary Jaguar XK120. Suffice to say, Porsche had a winning formula on their hands. There was one downside to the shockingly low weight of the 550 though. It wasn't really able to withstand crashes very well. They were infamous for crushing like a can of coke under high speed, making them extremely dangerous for the lucky few to ever drive them. The 550 wasn't Dean's first rodeo in the Porsche world. In March of 1955, Dean traded in his 53 MGTD for a brand spanking new speedster, which he drove hard. He competed in a number of races to great success, and it was at this point that he was under the spell of racing. On September the 21st of the same year, just around when he was finishing up filming on Giant, he traded in the speedster for the legendary 550 Spider, which he got from the same showroom. Presumably his ever-growing love of racing paired with a nice paycheck made it a necessary purchase for the 24-year-old. Legend has it that James himself had earned the nickname Little Bastard after a stunts driver who he was friends with gave it to him. Bill Hickman, who gave him the nickname, was called Big Bastard in return by Dean. Dean then decided to get some minor aesthetic modifications done to his 550 to make it race ready. Along with number 130 across the car, he also had his nickname painted on the back of the car, which transferred the nickname over to the Spider as well. On top of buying the 550 Spider, he also bought a 1955 Ford Country Squire, which he planned on using for transporting the 550 to and from race events. Just nine days later, Dean's luck would run out. Dean and his mechanic, Rolf Witherich, were at Competition Motors doing some final race prep for an imminent race that weekend over at Salinas. Now, although Dean had bought his Ford with the intention of using it as a way to tow the 550, he had a problem. His Porsche simply hadn't clocked up enough miles to qualify for the race. Therefore, Dean's mechanic decided that driving the 550 to the race as opposed to towing it could be a good way of bringing the miles up to let him race. So, Dean did just that. Dean began a near 300 mile long journey to the event, departing from Hollywood at around 2pm after stopping to fill up. Rolf Witherich, his mechanic, was in the passenger seat. The plan was to go north up the Golden State Highway and then further north to eventually get to the race. About an hour and a half after leaving, Dean was pulled over by a policeman a bit south of Bakersfield because he'd been caught driving 65 in a 55. It wasn't just Dean who got in a bit of trouble though. Hickman, Dean's friend and Hollywood stunt driver, and Sanford H. Roth, a photographer, both got caught going 20 over in Dean's Ford estate and were handed a ticket. Since Hickman had a trailer attached, he should have been going 45 miles an hour and that's why he got the ticket. After this minor kerfuffle, the gang went west in an effort to avoid the 25 limit through the middle of Bakersfield. The road they joined onto was the SR166 SR33. This road was a known road used by racers to get from Southern California up to Salinas faster and had a nickname, the Racers Road. This bit is actually not entirely clear, by the way. A researcher and biographer by the name of Warren Beeth instead thinks they'd actually gone through Bakersfield and joined the US 466 from there instead. Regardless, the trip was plain sailing until quarter to six that evening. A black and white Ford Tudor headed east down the 466 began turning left to head north towards Fresno. 
As the Ford was turning left, it crossed over the centre of the road directly in front of Dean, who was barrelling towards them at 85 miles an hour. As a keen, experienced racing driver, James knew that what was immediately ahead of him spelled disaster. In a quick-fire attempt to avoid a head-on crash, he tried to steer out of the way. Unfortunately, Dean ran out of tarmac and time. The Ford and the 550 mashed each other to pieces on impact. The Porsche cartwheeled a few times, landing on the edge of the road. The sheer speed of the collision moved the Ford into the opposite lane. Several witnesses saw the crash firsthand and immediately ran over to help. Dean had a weak pulse in his neck, according to a medically trained woman who was at the crash. It was challenging to pull him out of the car. His foot had been jammed in between the clutch and brake pedals, and he sustained a number of other serious injuries, putting him in critical condition. Before additional help arrived, it's noted that Bill Hickman helped in trying to get him out of the wreckage when they got to the crash 10 minutes after it happened. With a broken neck and damage all over his body, it was touch and go. By the time he had finally been pulled from the crumpled 550, he was unconscious and minutes from death's door. By the time they got to hospital, the 24-year-old actor was pronounced dead. He died in the arms of his good friend Bill Hickman. But Dean wasn't the only one in the car. His Porsche certified mechanic, Rolf Witherich, was sat beside him. Rolf was thrown from the car and landed in a crumpled heap next to the wrecked Porsche. He was taken away in the same ambulance and miraculously survived. Rolf sustained some heavy injuries himself, walking away from the crash with a broken jaw as well as hip and femur injuries which were immediately tended to with surgery. Well, yeah, correction, he, he didn't really walk away, but you know what I mean. The driver of the black and white Ford got off lightly, only having a couple of bruises across his face and a nosebleed. The 50s were a different time, and Donald Turnipseed, the driver of the Ford, simply hitchhiked his way home after a brief interview regarding the collision. Shortly after the crash made headlines, an inquest was opened around the crash on the 11th of October 1955. Donald said he couldn't see the spider until after he'd began turning left, by which time it was too late. The verdict was that it was an accidental death with no criminal intent. It's worth noting Turnipseed felt immense guilt despite the verdict over the crash, and although he moved on with his life, he would never forget the events which unfolded that day. He tried to stay out of the glaring eyes of the public, offering only a single interview immediately after the crash. James Dean's career spanned just five years, but he had captivated the West through his Academy-nominated performances. His untimely death shocked the world, but the part of his legacy which arguably stands out the most is the curse of the little bastard. The legend of the 550's curse began before the thing had even crashed. You see, Sir Alec Guinness said that on the 23rd of September 1955, he met with Dean at around dinner time. Dean showed Guinness his new Porsche and no doubt anticipated some compliments headed his way. Instead, Guinness said to Dean, Please, never get in. It's now 10 o'clock Friday the 23rd of September 1955. If you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. Shockingly, that prediction came true. The curse continued beyond the crash though, far beyond. It's thought that George Barris bought what remained of the 550 shortly afterwards. He himself actually marketed the car as being cursed by displaying the wreck publicly the following year. In the four years following the new ownership of the vehicle, the car continued to be involved in a number of accidents. George claimed that during the unloading of his new purchase, the 550 broke a mechanic's legs whilst they were unloading it. The car then went on tour in its wrecked state in an attempt to warn drivers at road safety conventions. He claimed that during this tour, a child's hip was broken when the car fell off a display. Additionally, it's also said to have fallen off a trailer killing a truck driver. In March of 1959, the car is also said to have caught on fire. Not much damage was done, though luckily, just some melted rubber and burnt off paint. Barris also sold a pair of tyres from the Spider, which apparently both blew simultaneously, causing yet another accident. This legend is all very speculative though, as an expert on James Dean, Lee Raskin, 
doesn't actually believe that George Barris ever properly owned the car at all. This is because the 550 Spider was registered by engine number rather than VIN, since a fellow racer by the name of Dr. William Eshrich kept hold of the engine and a few of the drivetrain components after buying it from the insurance company, it could be argued Barris didn't really ever own the 550. This explains the overlapping timelines by the way before you comment on how the dates don't add up. Whether or not Barris actually truly owned the car and whether these accidents all really happened remains a topic of debate. However, it's known for certain that William Estrich did buy the car for salvage. He dismantled what remained, including an almost unscathed engine. After installing the engine into his Lotus 9, he crashed the Lotus on the 21st of October 1956. The crash was non-fatal and the car was repairable. He had also lent some transmission and suspension components to Dr. Tony McHenry, who got into a fatal collision in the car. Both of these crashes happened in the same race, by the way. Eshrich wasn't done with the 550 parts just yet though. He fitted the drivetrain to another of his cars and that car also crashed. Here's where it gets technical and why many argue George Barris didn't really own the Spider. Eshrich's family still have possession of the original pink slip for the car along with the engine. As such, Lee Raskin still firmly believes that James Dean's Porsche is actually theirs. Not only that, but it's noted that the Spider on display looks to be in significantly better condition than how it was in the crash, which has led many to believe this display may not have even been James Dean's car at all. In 1960, the bits of the Porsche Barris owned mysteriously went missing. He claims that it was being shipped back from Florida and it mysteriously disappeared in transport. Now there's a lot of speculation around what actually happened to it, but Barris has since died and no one knows where the parts he owned are. It's thought by many that Barris decided to conveniently misplace the spider in an attempt to solidify the rumors of the car's curse. So here's where the remaining parts are that we know of. Historic auto attractions in Illinois claim to have a tiny lump of aluminium which had been stolen whilst it was in storage. The engine, numbered 90059 along with the pink slip, is still owned by Estrich's family. The transaxle assembly is owned by Zach Bagans who owns a TV series on Discovery. Interestingly, Lee Raskin published serial numbers for both Dean's 550 and the Speedster which he traded in. At the moment, neither of the car's whereabouts are actually known. And that's where our story ends today. Barris's side of the story leaves us sadly with more questions than answers, but there are a number of confirmed accidents following Dean's crash relating to the car, which are definitely grounds for many to see the spider as cursed. My one final point is this. Although it's always been reported that Dean was traveling at 85 miles an hour, according to recent computer-aided analysis, it appears that he was going no more than 60 miles an hour in reality. Apologies for taking so long to upload this one. I had a couple of other videos I was a good way through writing, and I decided to scrap them, so that's my excuse. Also, I've started a second channel on which I plan on making less formal videos about a wider range of topics. So if you're into opinion pieces and more speculative stuff like mysteries, definitely go and check it out. Thanks for watching.